Remember that the light that comes in through the bottom of the thin section is polarized in a particular direction. So exactly what you see depends on the way that that light interacts with the lattice of whatever crystal is passing through. So as you rotate a crystal, you're changing the orientation of the lattice with respect to that incoming light. Now, the color that you see depends on how that light interacts with the lattice. In one orientation, the light might interact with the crystal in one way, and as you rotate the stage, it might interact with the crystal in a different way. This could give rise to different colors or different color intensities in different orientations, and this is what we call pleochroism. The mineral we've been watching is called yoderite, and it shows these changes in color and color intensity depending on orientation. So it's one example of pleochroism. Pleochroism can be really intense. This is biotite, light when the cleavage planes are running north-south, almost black when, it's, when they're running east-west. This is called normal pleochroism when the orientation of the cleavage planes is parallel to the lower polarization. Pleochroism can be one of the few ways that we can identify some minerals. This very fine-grained blue to purple to maybe yellowish-green mineral is almost certainly glaucophane because that's about the only mineral that has that pleochroism. A certain composition, andalusite, has distinctive pink pleochroism, commonly developed in andalusite cores rather than rims. So I interpret this as an andalusite crystal largely because the cores have this pink pleochroism. Pleochroism can be pretty subtle. This clintonite crystal, basically a calcium biotite, is sort of pinkish when, it's, when the cleavage planes are running north-south and a little more greenish when they're running east-west. This kind of pink-green pleochroism is important for identifying orthopyroxene. Here it is more or less green when it runs east-west and pink when it runs north-south. I use pleochroism all the time to identify metamorphic minerals. Here I can clearly see three different minerals. One is blue, one is green, and the other is yellow. And from those colors in pleochroism, I can identify what they are. Pleochroism can distinguish among different similar minerals. Here the cores of these minerals are very light green pleochroic. Those are actinolite. And then there's a darker green rim, which is hornblende. Radiation damage in some minerals also causes pleochroic halos. The light dots in there are radioactive minerals. The darker halos around them are the radiation damage. And you can see that they are pleochroic as well. They vary in intensity. These radiation damage halos around radioactive inclusions in cordierite are one of the main ways that I identify this mineral. These yellow pleochroic halos are especially distinctive. Biotite has what we call normal pleochroism. This is when the cleavage planes are parallel to the lower polarizer the mineral is darkest. So here when we see it runs east-west, the biotite is darkest. That's different from tourmaline, which has reverse pleochroism. So when the long axis of the grains are running east-west, biotite is darkest. But when tourmaline, the long axis of the grain, is running north-south, it is darkest. It's the reverse of biotite, so we call it reverse pleochroism. This zircon has an inherited core, which is a little more intensely pink than the remainder of the zircon. 
this helps me identify inherited cores versus metamorphic or igneous rims. This is a garnet with some color zoning to it. I don't know, you can see it's completely garnet. Could you see that color zoning though? It was pretty subtle. The core is a little bit pinker than the rim. However, if I put in the substage condenser, then the core is much more distinctly pink than the rim. I can show you some little boundaries here to make that clearer. But in normal polarized light, it's very hard to see this. The substage condenser makes a big difference. This reflects chemical zoning, but in exactly which elements you would need an electron probe to figure that out. It's important to distinguish color zoning from textural zoning. So here's a garnet that has more inclusions in the core than on the rim. That doesn't mean it's chemically zoned. It could be, but um, mostly what you're seeing is a textural zonation, not a color or chemical zonation. One last example of color zoning. This is epidote group minerals. The core has low manganese. The rims that are distinctly pink and orange have high manganese. And so that's a chemical zoning that manifests itself as pleochroic differences.